I'd like to offer a few words for Dominic and Jane, and uh, perhaps for all of us this afternoon. <clears throat> knock, knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Doctor. Doctor Who. Ah, well, you see, if you know Dominic and Jane, is, it, is he a favourite of both of yours? Mm. Again, another shared passion, Doctor Who. I don't, hope I'm not giving anything away about something later in the service, but um, nevertheless, he made something of a... Impressive return this past weekend. Jane, were you able to um, watch it last You did? This morning. S okay, so there are no spoilers in this. Okay, all right. Uh, this morning, you watched Doctor Who this morning on your wedding day. <laughs> Good Lord. I was awake. Well, at least that's one way to relax and take your mind off things, perhaps. Um, well, Peter Capaldi, uh, of course, the, uh, making his first proper appearance as the, 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 new, the 12th Doctor. Um, uh, that's right, isn't it? It is the 12th. I've got that right. Testing you now, you see. I'm testing you. Um, Peter Capaldi actually first appeared here in Little Missenden Church. Um, so Doctor Who's actually been here in the place where you married today. Um, he was part of a star-studded cast we had here for an ITV production that, um, involving Charles Dance, Sheila Hancock, Neve Cusack, Peter Capaldi, Claire Holman, um, Amelia Fox. Uh, there was a whole long list of them. It wasn't a particularly savoury... Um, subject, I think, that they were filming. It was called Fallen Angel. It was about um, an English vicar played by Charles Dance and his child-killing psychopathic daughter played by Amelia Fox, strangely. <laughs> Interesting bit of casting. But nevertheless, Peter Capaldi was, uh, was among them and he was here. He walked these very tiles that you have walked today, Doctor Who himself. And uh, I did actually happen to catch a, uh, an opportunity to watch the, the first episode with him. I'm not a, a, myself a Doctor Who aficionado, but I thought I would um, adopt that theme for you both today. Um, maybe it will be more meaningful. <clears throat> As ever, because he's the new, newly regenerated 12th Doctor, the episode focused, I think, a little bit, Jane, would you agree, on questions of identity? Uh, because not least, of course, he's now in his new self, um, uh, coming to terms, or rather he's not, but his companion, what's her name in the, in the program? Uh, Clara. Companion, Clara, is ca coming to terms with having lost the... the the dishy young uh, Matt Smith, and she's inherited somebody who's somewhat older, a bit grey, a bit, bit, bit wrinkly, and um, not entirely convinced. I beg your pardon? Terrible. Terrible, I don't know. It's shocking, isn't it? Shocking. Uh, and so um, she's not entirely sure who this new, new person is, you see. And um, later in the, the episode, there's, there's an interesting moment where, where Peter Capaldi, the new doctor, turns to Clara and he, he asks her, Am I a good man? And there's this pregnant pause, and she looks him up and down, and she says, well, I, I really don't know. Because at this point, of course, she's looking on the outside. She's not looking beyond um, uh, first impressions and, and outward appearances. And uh, there's a lovely... Um, for those of you that haven't watched this particular episode, it, it's, it involves a dinosaur um, uh, strolling around Westminster in Victorian London... Uh, and on the banks of the river, there, there are crowds, of course, turning out to, to wander at this uh, amazing sight. And among them uh, is what, what appears to be a Victorian lady, veiled in black. And she lifts her veil, and it turns out to be a lizard woman, who is, in fact, a private detective who um, spans the, the you know, time itself as well, known the Doctor of old. And um, fast forwarding to uh, another rather lovely um, episode in the programme, a passage in the, in the programme, where um, she's admonishing Clara for not trusting the Doctor and not knowing who he is. And she sits there with her veil lowered, and they're having this dialogue, and she, the lizard woman, what's her, madam, what's her name? I'm testing you again, you see, something like madam, madam, anyone? Doctor Who aficionados here, anyone? Astra? Vastra. Fantastic, because I was going to say Astrid. Oh, God, I got that wrong, wouldn't I? Vastra, Madame Vastra, the lizard woman. And uh, anyway, she, she's having this dialogue with him, admonishing Clara. And, um, and she's speaking about the reason she wears the veil is so that she can fit in uh, to society, which perhaps can't entirely accept who she is and can't see beyond her scaly exterior. And as they're talking, Clara su suddenly becomes aware that the veil has vanished. And she says with surprise, when did you stop wearing the veil? And Madame Vastra says, when you stop seeing it. And um, I love contemporary programmes like Doctor Who. Sometimes you get some really rich veins of theology and philosophy going on. But actually, there's a message there, of course. For any two people, um, uh, 
doing what you're doing today, which is uh, um, actually consecrating a journey you've already begun as you make promises, which undoubtedly already in your heart you have, but today you make those formally and, and not only legally but spiritually in this, this place. Um, and it's a message, of course, for two people as you are being challenged to, to all of us, actually, to look beyond the veil and to be beyond the outward appearance and to the heart. And it's for, for this reason I, I want to suggest something to you um, now, which uh, may sound uh, at once si mildly controversial, so I shall immediately qualify what I mean, uh, so there's no doubt. But that is to say that marriage is not an end in itself, but it is a means to an end. Marriage is not an end in itself, it is a means to an end. And that end is growing up. Growing up. And the reason I think that um, is, is twofold, primarily. One, the preface to the marriage service with which I began, those five paragraphs reminding us of the reasons for the institution of holy matrimony. Um, I said this, I abstract. Marriage is a gift of God in creation through which husband and wife may know the grace of God. It is given that as husband and wife grow together in love and trust, they might grow to maturity in love. In other words, they might grow up together or grow old together in love. And part of that, of course, part of the challenge of that is looking beyond the merely romantic, the merely passionate, which, of course, is so vital, and, and we pray that you will somehow keep that spark alive for all the years to come. But actually, it's looking beyond to something so much more profound and lasting and beautiful. And so the other reason I, I think this about marriage uh, and it's about growing up. Um, Paul, in that passage we heard in his letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, we're so familiar with it perhaps on occasions such as this, but in the, it's really a song of love, um, if you might read it as such. And in the fourth stanza of that song, he says this. He says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I behaved like a child. But when I became an adult, I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And in so doing, St. Paul also speaks about um, growing up in love. And, and he does so actually having unfolded for us what it means to love as God loves us. And that's, of course, selflessly, not selfishly. Um, love which is not arrogant, rude, puffed up or proud. It doesn't seek its own end. Um, but it, it endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Love never ends. Love which looks beyond the veil. So um, that's what I think, and it's a rather wonderful and exciting adventure for any two people, and I think marriage supremely is, a, is a, perhaps a wonderful um, symbol of what human relationships might be. You don't come here, Dominic, today with your design and ambition on this marriage, not wanting to turn Jane into the wife you really want, and Jane, likewise, you don't come here today with your design and ambition, wanting to turn Dominic into the husband that you really want. But actually, you're here today because you found the people, each of you, that you trust to enable you to grow up into the people God made you to be. Not who you each want the other to be, but who God made you to be. And sometimes that will um, be quite costly, quite challenging. It will involve sacrifice, and that's why St. Paul speaks about learning to love as God loves us. God so loved the world, he gave. He gave us Jesus. Today, Dominic, you so love Jane, you are about to give yourself entirely to her. And Jane, you so love Dominic, today you are about to give yourself entirely to him. And there are words which they are both about to say, not so much in the vows as in the exchange of rings. As they exchange rings, they will say these words, which are deeply, deeply beautiful and actually searingly challenging for any two people. Because they will say, I give you this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body I honour you. All that I am I give to you. And all that I have I share with you. Everything, entirely, 100%. Here it is. Here I am. And it's a mutual covenant that you make. And it might actually humanly be impossible were it not for the fact that you then immediately say in those words, you conclude with, within the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
and it's learning to love and to grow up in that love as God loves us. So I just want to conclude with, I promised Dominic and Jane um, the punchline because I made an observation about the shape of the marriage service, which is quite intriguing, um, and it's lost on most of us. It took me many years before I clocked what was going on, um, having conducted hundreds of marriages. Um, but um, you will know, by convention, the bride's family sit on the left and the groom on the right, facing that way. Um, and other than the immediate family, I hope you've all been mixed and muddled up, as rightly you should be, but that's the convention. And when the bride enters the church, she comes in on her father's right arm because she's at the outermost point of her family's side of the church because she's about to be given away. And that's why the vicar would say, I don't say it now because it's not in the modern marriage service, but the vicar would say in the Book of Common Prayer three centuries ago, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Because it certainly wouldn't have been anything to do with Jane. She was sort of incidental, really. Um, she didn't have any will or autonomy of her own, not three centuries ago. Um, it was really a property transaction between her prospective husband uh, and her father. And, of course, that is a lot of nonsense. Um, and actually, there's a subtle reversal going on because when they leave today, and they will do it today, it's what persists in the, the marriage service, um, the bride leaves on her husband's left arm, comes in on father's right, leaves on husband's left. Jane will be here and Dominic will be here. And according to that historic um, assessment of marriage, uh, what's really going on, you see, is, is um, Dominic is stepping between Jane and her family as though to say, she's mine now, I've taken possession of her because it was all about demarcating the lines of ownership. And that is truly, of course, a lot of nonsense. Uh, in our 21st century, rapidly evolving understanding of marriage and of human relationships, of course, there should be an absolute equality between you. So I want to leave you with this thought, with the enlightened eyes of our 21st century understanding of marriage. What in fact is going on in ref in a way to reflect symbolically the words which you're about to say as you exchange rings, is this. Dominic, in fact, is placing Jane between himself and his family, and for the first time this afternoon, he will be introducing um, his new wife. He will be saying, this is Jane, my wife, whom I love. She comes before me. I place her before myself. And she comes before you. Because actually, of course, one of the other um, challenging aspects of any new marriage um, is those familial relationships which have nurtured you and brought you to where you are today, which you cherish, of course, have to adapt to accommodate this new reality for you both, which is your marriage. That becomes, for you, a priority. And Jane, likewise, is, is this afternoon, she will be for the first time introducing her new husband. This is, this is Dominic, my husband, whom I love. He comes before me. I place him before myself. And he comes before you. And it rather beautifully, I think, um, reinforces and exemplifies um, that sacrificial, which is a beautiful thing, potentially, aspect of marriage, which is sometimes lost. And remember, it's about growing up and looking beyond the veil and looking to a lifetime together of growing old together in that love with which God loves us.